hello everyone. So I think I'm going to slowly start. Um, there will be more and more people coming into the room, but I think uh, most people know what's going on and where they're headed to. Um, so, yeah, so we asked um, basically a while back, we asked on Twitter, our community, what would they um, hear about most likely in the next um, comings and bio meetups. And most people actually voted that they would like to know more about big science projects, collaborations and funding. And so we took that as our tonight's meetup topic. And I'm glad so many people could actually join and are not fed up with Zoom webinars by now at, in the midst of a pandemic. I also hope everybody is well off and healthy and not going so crazy at home. So um, I'm going to start today with um, the, some housekeeping. So I would like to acknowledge the tr traditional custodians of the land that we are meeting on today and pay um, our respect to their um, elders past and present. And we also, in terms of because we did so many um, polls lately. We created another poll to get a bit bigger image of our audience today. Since one of our questions is about funding, we thought it might be useful to actually get an image of how many people are funded by which funding bodies. So we created a little poll that should actually start once I, once I launch it in the Zoom webinar. And you have several answers to choose from. So yeah, um, the question is why, what is your pri prime source of funding? And there's the usual funding bodies, ARC, NHMRC, but also universities, industry, business, business grants. And just um, tick the one that most applies to you, or if you're a student, maybe the one that your supervisor obtains its funding from. So I'm just, just gonna launch just now, and I hope this works. And um, at the, the idea is that at the start of the, funding discussion, um, we can reveal the results of, of this poll. So I can see people starting to vote. There's a race going on between ARC and university and HMRC. So I can see it's working, that's great. So I will um, just let people vote while we're continuing with the, um, with the introduction. So yeah, um, I don't know if you've heard, but the 2021 SBA conference is going ahead. And uh, yeah, it's taking place on the 13th and 14th of September, 2021. It's gonna be fully online. And I can highly, only highly recommend um, registering if you haven't done that yet. So I think the early bird has been, the early bird registration have been extended, right? I think Natalie, you probably know most about it. Maybe you can, you can say a few words later on to, to, to that. Um, yeah, and uh, there is going to be a very exciting speaker lineup. And um, if you register for the conference, you also get a two year membership of the SBA free. And on that note, I would also like to thank our sponsors or tonight's sponsors, which are Decode Science, the ARC Center of Excellence, NEB Biolabs, and yeah, Twist Bioscience, obviously the SBA. So yeah, we decided to host this webinar as another panel discussions which we had previously on entrepreneurship, collaboration and innovation. Um, this time we actually have five panelists and I'm very excited to share that we have people from all different parts of research and science. So we have people from academia, people from government research institutions um, and um, people from industry and consulting agencies uh, here today. And I hope they can answer all your questions that you're going to have about funding and collaboration. The SBA team, um, that means Andy, Kirsten, Maciek, and Nick and me, we also prepared some curated questions and we will pose them in the first 15 minutes, but we have, a, we have the Q&A section in Zoom. And yeah, please just post all your questions in the Q&A section. And you can also upvote your own questions or each other's questions, and we can basically post them later on then to the, to the audience, direct them to the audience. So um, for now, I would like to give a word to our experts on the panel. And um, we have, I think in order, we have Ian. And um, if you could just introduce yourself in like two to three minutes and maybe mention how have you been involved in a big science project? And when we talk about big science, that can be anything. It doesn't have to be the human genome project. It can, can be anything like a bigger linkage grant, um, CSEP, a center of excellence. I think that would be very helpful. 
So I'm going to give the word to Ian now, and um, maybe you can start. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Can I just check first that people can hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, well, look, th thanks, Tom, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, and look, thanks for the invitation. Um, and also, congratulations on running a panel on on big science. This is this is sort of a really important topic area for us all. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the Deputy Director of the Centre for Agriculture and the Bioeconomy at QUT. Uh, and I also have a role where I represent the Queensland Government as the Queensland Biofutures Industry Envoy. Uh, this is a role in which I provide advice and support to the Queensland Government to grow their biofutures sector in, in Queensland. Um, so one of the challenges that we face in Australia is that as a high cost uh, developed country with a big export focus, our farmers compete into international markets with lower cost producers. Uh, you know, the world's got unfair subsidies uh, and we in Australia overwhelmingly export bulk commodities with limited added value. So the research that we do focuses on value adding to agriculture to create new opportunities uh, for high value products in emerging green sustainable markets for bio-based products. So we look at markets, technologies, economics and policy uh, to try and explore ways of capturing these opportunities. And in this area, we run several large research projects, uh, one of which is called the Waste to Profits Project. Uh, I'll probably talk more about this project tonight. Uh, it's a $14 million project. We've got about 20, 20 partners, around 65 researchers across Australia. Uh, and all working to deliver a step change in the management of waste in livestock processing industries. We've got other projects too, and again, I'll probably reference some of them tonight. But when I think about big science, I think about the big global challenges. Uh, as a society, we need 70% more food by 2050. So think about producing 70% more food. That's more water, more land, more fertiliser, we need also 50% more energy by 2050. Uh, but in the same time frame, we need to completely decarbonise our society uh, to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. So to make it even more difficult, we can't just exploit our land resource. We need to halt our loss of biodiversity. We need to regenerate degraded ecosystems. And we need to rebuild from the position we're in. So these are the challenges that we face as scientists, uh, as synthetic biologists, as members of civil society. These are the challenges that we need to be aiming up to solve. And, you know, small projects won't do it, won't cut it. Uh, we need big science to solve these sorts of big, big challenges. And big science is necessary to advance progress. So look, um, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of the panel. Very happy to be here. Uh, I'll leave it there for now and happy to, um, to take questions later on. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That was already quite a lot. I think that answered already some of our questions, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we continue with Ned. I think most people know Ned, but maybe just a brief introduction of what you understand about big science. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dom. And thanks for inviting me today. Um, SBA Sydney Node, pleasure to be here. Um, yes, I'm Natalie Kurak. Um, I'm the president of the Synthetic Biology Australasia Association. Um, I have I work for Bio Platforms as their partnership strategic partnerships manager, um, and as well as that, I have a, a, a co-chair position for the Global Biofoundry Alliance, which is a network of publicly funded genome foundries, um, and more recently taken on the CSO role in a part-time capacity for a startup called Eden Brew making dairy without the cow. So I'm a bit busy, but um, I've done a, I've been involved with a lot of big science projects, probably over, well, since, um, gosh, I came back to work after breeding. So probably about eight years ago. So um, commencing with yeast 2.0, and I agree with Ian's sentiment about big science is necessary to solve big problems. Um, it provides context to work. 
Um, it builds large data resources and sets of information that can be then used exponentially for, 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 for greater impact. Um, and it also allows, um, catalyzes scientific collaboration and linkages, um, which are really important for increasing depth. Because as science becomes more multidisciplinary, those linkages and these big science type projects become more relevant. Um, by platforms is has a big science, I guess, framework, and we run what we call the national data projects or the framework initiatives, and they are Australian-centric, large, big science projects where we bring together all the specialists in a certain field and set criteria to solve a particular problem or create a particular resource. Typically, it's um, analytical data sets, so big genome data sets of things like melanoma tumors or um, conservation orientated projects such as um, koala genome or endangered marsupials of Australia. And so, uh, yeah, they're Australian centric projects. And, and I think that's important as well because nobody else is going to solve Australian problems and we can only do um, locally um, what's important for us and sustainability of our environment. Is is, I think that's it. Tom. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. No, I think it was great. Yeah, great to hear your opinion on uh, big science as well. Um, so I think next up is Mark Hutchinson. The yeah, I'll leave the word to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Tim. Um, so uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge um, I'm on Ghana land, uh, and uh, greetings to you from South Australia. Um, I uh, wear multiple hats. Uh, all of them are directed towards big science. So I'm a professor in medicine. Uh, I am an Australian Research Council uh, Future Fellow, uh, and I'm the director of the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Nanoscale Biophotonics. So my day job involves coordinating 200 scientists to do something amazing with ARC funds. Uh, but in addition to that day job, uh, I'm the president-elect of Science and Technology Australia. Um, we are the peak body in Australia that represents the 88,000 scientists and technologists in industry and academia uh, to try and put the best foot forward in Canberra and more broadly um, as to why science is important. And I guess my message here today is that big science uh, today is actually the only the beginning of a much larger challenge that we have to actually make big science possible but also to translate big science because big science actually needs big has, it needs big policy, it needs government, it needs industry, it needs social license, uh, it needs internationalization. And uh, as scientists, we like to talk in our language uh, around topics that we get excited about and I'm more than happy to talk science to anybody who's willing to listen but the language that we use inherently, uh, unfortunately, excludes many of the people that we need at the table to enable the translation of big science outcomes. And so the, the journey that I've been on um, in drug development of human molecule, uh, from molecules from the bench to clinical utility, um, technologies from dry lab physics benches to use in surgical uh, practice, all requires very large convergent science teams to work collaboratively together, uh, which ask very large questions. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you about how we might be able to fund those things, uh, how we might be able to do collaborations in a new way so that all you excitable uh, students don't know that big science is any different to small science because it's all just fun uh, translational impact. So thanks for having me. All right, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, yeah, I think we're going to have very, a really exciting discussion later, um, and I think we can all really benefit from, from all your experience and um, yeah, the past you've already taken. Um, so next up is Paul Hardle, and um, yeah, I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thanks for joining us, Paul. And thanks for inviting me, Dom, and um, pleasure to be here this evening with you all. Uh, I feel completely out-scienced with uh, those various introductions because I, um, I studied engineering at university and realized quite early on in my career that I was never going to be a particularly good engineer, but realized that my heart and 
capability such as it is, is in the business sector. So I spent my whole career um, in industry, mostly in IT and telco businesses, helping basically them get bigger and frankly more profitable. <clears throat> um, but I've always, the one thing that particularly resonated with me back in the distant days of my engineering degree was the segment that we uh, covered on renewables, which always absolutely fascinated me, the idea that we could power the world with energy that is effectively free and given to us. Um, that's always been a passion of mine, so much so that my wife and I built a little house um, 25 odd years ago, powered by a little micro hydro system, which um, appealed to me immensely to be able to achieve that. And for the last five years, that's really accelerated. I've got increasingly concerned about climate change and the impact on all of us and our kids' futures and what have you. So for the last five years, I've decided to focus as much as possible of my time on helping the smartest scientists commercialize the smartest clean energy technology to really accelerate the transition to 100% renewables 100% of the time um, in, in the best possible way. And because I'm fundamentally a business guy, my view is that the best way of doing that in the fastest possible time is to, is to help those brilliant teams out of the universities represented here tonight and across Australia and out of CSIRO and so on, um, commercialize, spin out, raise money, um, and, uh, and make meaningful change as fast as we possibly can. So I've mentored on CSIRO's on program and energy lab with a, with a particular focus on clean energy teams for the last five years. And I'm a judge and mentor still with those teams. And I particularly focus on identifying the smartest teams, helping them find money and helping them um, commercialize with all that entails. So I am I'm very much that uh, um, translation into commercialization aspect of big science. <clears throat> Hope that's enough of an introduction. Yep. No, that's great. I think uh, that's great to hear that you have more on like a business side of you because I think I speak for a lot of the people in the audience as well, at least for the people at Macquarie. I mean, you sort of like got back, back down in your research. If you're a PhD student, you maybe not have that much interaction with any commercial side of what you're actually doing and your potential. So I think it's, it's great that you're here and you can share sharing your advice, definitely. Um, Last but not least, we have Deborah um, representing the DPI. Um, if you could just also give an introduction and how you've been uh, um, involved in big science research. Thank you very much. I'll just check that everybody can hear me okay. My um, reception can be a little bit dodgy sometimes. All okay? Good, good. Okay, so I'm Deborah Hailstone. So I work with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries in our Chief Scientist branch as Manager Stock Science Strategy. Thanks so much to the organisers for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to sharing my thoughts and learning a lot. Uh, I actually started out in medical research and joined the department more than 20 years ago. I led my own research for quite some time um, and then transitioned into a series of leadership and management roles. And in my current role, I suppose, in this context, I'm supporting the brilliant. So working across DPI's R&D portfolio to ensure that we're doing the right science with the right people, using the right technologies, complying with overarching legislation, those kinds of issues. Um, officially, I'm responsible for leading, developing and coordinating strategic R&D opportunities across DPI and in partnership with industry, universities, other jurisdictions and so forth. Um, key amongst those is the interaction that we have with the synthetic biology program and the node of use 2.0 running out of um, Macquarie University. We're also a partner organisation in the centre of excellence. A lot of people don't realise the depth and breadth of research that is actually within government. Uh, by way of example, um, DPI's research portfolio is worth about $100 million per year and about half of those funds are sourced externally. We have a very strong partnership model. We've got more than 600 full-time researchers. At any one point in time, we're running more than 500 projects. 
It's a broad, highly multidisciplinary, very well connected portfolio, delivering highly applied research that is very outcome focused. DPI thinks of big science as being those uh, multidisciplinary global projects that build really big, meaningful collaborations and partnerships. And I suppose we see as one of our key aims to try to improve that connectivity of our portfolio internationally and across our own uh, across our own nation. I certainly have to echo Nat's thoughts there that there are so many uniquely Australian issues uh, and that's a lot of where our focus actually is because nobody else is going to do that for us. Um, I'm also at the moment involved with um, bringing together a $20 million project for DPI, which will deliver um, an, a, a foundational infrastructure for us to help us actually connect to new and emerging genetic technologies. So things like gene editing and um, synthetic biology and so forth. It's a virtual center, but it's really about trying to drive those connections for our portfolios and bring the benefits of those technologies to our stakeholders. We very much see translation or adoption of research outcomes as a key measure of our success, but we acknowledge that it's really hard to measure impact. Um, we have in the past done a lot more um, direct translation to industry. We've moved more away from that model now, hoping to see private enterprise move into that space. But for us, that's actually still one of the most difficult things associated with research, being able to show that our applied outputs from our research have actually then been adopted. For us, a mission around big science and thinking about how we move our, our portfolio and the results for our stakeholders into that next phase and into harnessing big science. So is really motivated by thinking about what are the questions that we can't answer on our own. Um, we can't be world leaders in everything, but how we link to and partner with people who can help us develop new capacity and provide, I suppose, some more uh, science perhaps at the higher risk, more blue sky end compared to the kind of applied research that we've traditionally specialised in. But we're really interested too in thinking about what are new models of collaboration? How do we do that better? How do we ensure that we've got really strong partnerships underpinning our portfolio? That's probably it for me. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks for the introduction. That's great. I hope that by now everybody has joined and actually got um, to hear to everybody's uh, introduction. And I'm just going to share my screen again to just give you an outline of the um, schedule, of the further schedule. So we just uh, heard every panelist uh, introducing themselves. And thanks again for joining us here today. Um, so first topic will be funding focused, and um, we're going to have a quick look at our Yvonne, Yvonne poll on funding to see where most people are funded by. And then basically we go on, dive on to like uh, collaborations, more, more collaboration focused questions. And then our third topic is a bit more blue sky, like your vision of big science. And I think a lot of people already answered um, that question, like how do they see the, um, big science and what they want to see in the future, which I think is uh, really interesting. Um, in each section, we're going to start with two or three questions that um, the SBA Sydney team have thought about in the last months. And then um, while we're doing that, everybody in the audience can post questions in the Q&A specifically to certain people, to certain experts on the panel or to everyone. And we're going to hopefully um, be able to ask them all at the end of each section. So rather than having all questions and answers at the end, we thought it would be better to have specific um, topic specific questions. Um, at each um, section's ends. All right, and then in the end, we also have um, a, a prize sponsored by Decode Science, a $400 twist voucher for gene synthesis. And that goes to the person that is um, the most interactive in today's audience. So that um, should be, should be um, enough to incentivize you to post your questions in the Q&A section. Um, yeah, so I think we can start. And I don't know if I can share the poll easily. 
So for now, most people, um, so about over 35 people have voted. And um, yes, 47% leading um, basically the field. Most people are funded by the ARC. And then second, um, second is 46% uh, is university actually. And then followed by the NHMRC and topic specific government grants. And then uh, after that, we have foundations or trusts. So that's 9% of all people. Um, we have industry with 18% actually. So there are quite a lot of industry people in the audience as well. Then we have 6% business grants and 3% venture capitalists. And um, then we have 9% industrial funds and 3% privately funded. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Um, I hope we can maybe share that later on, maybe on Twitter, Kirsten. I think it would be, I can also press share results. I don't know if everybody gets these results now, um, but we will definitely share that on later and in our YouTube video and then our Twitter channel. So um, we just saw that probably most people are funded by the ARC and university, and uh, that maybe not come as a surprise for most people. So we were thinking about um, a first questions basically targeted towards ECR and how can ECRs enable their own research. So um, if you were an early career researcher and you had a really big, bright idea, um, how would you manage to leverage a lot of money for funding? Where would you go to? Which funding body would you go to? Or is that something that you have to build up over time? So you have to create them, um, yeah, CV first and like be a senior person. Um, so we were thinking that can be, their funding can come from anything, can come from the government or can come from like private and like privately funded money. So I thought maybe Paul, if you, you have experience in mentoring startups, you could maybe answer that from a, like a commercial point of view, from an industry point of view. And I think, yeah, I mean, Mark and uh, Ian, you have extensive experience in like funding the ARCs and obtaining funding for, for the center of excellence. So I think um, we, we probably have like a different, different points on, on that question. So whoever wants to start first and, and give their take on it, um, that would be great. To be honest, I don't think it should really be me starting first. Mark, do you want to kick off from the ARC perspective, sure. given that I kind yeah. of represent the VC private piece, which based on your poll is two fifths of not much. Yeah. So I think, I think the key part that I'm seeing in that poll is a major problem for anybody on this call now, if you are going to survive in big science in the next 10 years, because yeah. those pots, are pots where you will experience, learn helplessness. Um, it is a lottery that is not worthwhile persisting only in that pool. Um, I was on a call with 20 senior investigators who were whinging about why they had not been asked to apply for an MRSF pot that was specifically in their area. None of them had asked the question, how do I convince the government to create the pot that I care about to actually make the change that I wish to see? We need as scientists to be identifying the political, societal and industry leaders who are willing to stand with us to actually put the funding packages together to address the big questions, because we know the big questions that are really needing to be answered. Government doesn't necessarily know them. If they're watching today, tonight, or reading in the Australian, you're not going to have big questions that really matter being asked. So I would be suggesting if you have a new idea as a PhD student, which might be your PhD project, you have a unique opportunity to incubate that idea within your PhD so that you can plan to be the CSO or CEO of the startup at the end of your PhD, which is then translating the outcomes from your work. Don't think that my PhD is gonna turn into a thesis and then I can become a postdoc and then I can get a lecturing position. That's not gonna happen in Australia um, under the current government plan. And despite me being Science Technology Australia president-elect and trying to keep Australian science flowing through, this is an uphill battle that we are 
not seeing money getting made available in grants, our language of a grant is let's go and do amazing fun science that we find exciting. The government means when they give a grant, it is an investment that they expect to return upon within a short time frame, And for them, that's an election cycle. That changes the whole mandate that we have when we start talking about grants. So an NHMRC grant, an ARC grant, these are fantastic blue sky opportunities, but gosh, we have to start thinking about a return on a real return on investment, which is not just the publication. And so that means start thinking big, start thinking outside the square, start thinking about, well, if this is such a good idea, who in industry is going to want my solution and let's start partnering with them now so that they can pay for this work, mm -hmm. uh, which will then create new jobs and opportunities for you down the line. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for the honest words. Um, that might be, might be very sobering to hear from a lot of people that are now at university, but I, I guess a lot of people are also, yeah, probably have the same feeling, right? Where there's an increasing competition going on and it's increasingly harder to get those grants and it feels like you said, like sometimes like a lottery. So um, yeah, we are wondering also from, the, from an industry point of view, if you want to commercialize your idea, where would you leverage money from, from private, privately funded money. And that's why I was thinking about Paul because he's been a mentor and on, on like accelerator programs and you have an idea, like how do you approach um, yeah, venture capitalists or, or other private funding bodies? Look, I don't have Mark's perspective and Mark's perspective incidentally makes abundantly good sense to me. I can fully understand that. And it's it could well be a little bit bleak for those that are, I don't know, bachelors or PhD students or whatever, listening in and thinking, geez, what's my future path look like? I would, I would look at it, I would try and in, encourage you all to look at it, for those in that audience, look at it as a positive lens. So <clears throat> I do a lot of work with, with teams of people that are way brighter than I am on science. Uh, a number of listening in here this evening. And I, I apply a commercial lens to that science and I think, well, if I was to commercialize it or as, as part of the commercialization path, who was going to get ma maximum value out of that? And that begins, broadly speaking, by thinking of the potential industry partners that have a combination of, you know, financial capability. In other words, they're not generally a startup. <laughs> um, and the reach to be able to actually help commercialize that technology. So if you're if you're working, you know, my, my, my focus, as we've discussed, is clean energy. So if you're working on a new type of electrolyte or a new type of storage technology or whatever it may be, you look at those large organizations where that tech could slot in. And I then intentionally go about targeting those organizations in the innovation teams within those organizations and all the heads of the business units that that tech could apply for, uh, uh, could apply to with the intent of exploring partnerships with those organizations that can ultimately help commercialize that technology, both in terms of, you know, taking the tech to an MVP, a minimal viable, viable product for those not familiar with the commercial jargon and thereafter actually distributing that and selling that technology somehow. So it kind of builds really very neatly, I think, in what Mark's message was. Think about your science and the application of that science. And, and there's never too early a point, I wouldn't have thought, to start thinking about which those industry partners may be. And if I may get, go a step further, um, consider, consider what you want out of your research. So in other words, if you if ultimately you want a job in one of those industry partners, once you've done your PhD or whatever it may be, then great. Um, you know, you'll demonstrate your capability as part of that process. If conversely, you see commercial application to what you're working on, have that lens in mind from the earliest point. So I, I, I work with, I've, I've, I've mentored a few teams that are at the bachelor's level. I haven't even completed the bachelor's degree yet. I'm thinking of one, a team out of UTS and a team out of Wollongong that I've worked with through CSIRO. Um, 
and, and have brilliant tech and already proactively thinking about how, how to use that tech in business. And as I say, there's never too, there's never too early a point in time to start thinking about that and start leveraging those university networks, the networks represented here tonight to start thinking about those commercialization opportunities. Because if you've got the commercialization opportunities, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but that will add significant value to the ability to actually raise a grant, should that be an intermediary step. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, uh, yeah, that brings me like the, basically your comments bring me to the next question. You mentioned earlier as well that um, you basically have to, the scientists have to pose the big science questions, right? Because the government is not gonna ask them. They don't have the idea what, what these big science questions are gonna be. So I was wondering how much influence you can have on the government and on a policy making as, as a scientist. And we were thinking how, basically the question was, how do you put your topic, re, your research on, on the political agenda? And may, maybe uh, our representatives that work more for, for the government can answer this question. Do you have an influence um, over, yeah, maybe Ned can answer, can answer that question. Um, thanks, Don. Yeah, um, maybe because I'm re relatively new to that transition into government um, from science, but what has struck me is that how receptive government is. And I'm not saying you can walk in the door and say, hey, try this. I'm like amazed. I guess it's like when you're a kid and you have this vision that all adults know what they're talking about. Um, and then you become an adult and you realize that's it's not quite right. Um, the same sort of thing. You think the government's got it all worked out. They have some big agenda. Um, it's all under control. I mean, you know, political <laughs> opinions aside. And, um, but really they're actually very receptive. And I have lots of meetings with state government with various government departments and they want to know and they want to hear and they want to know how to help. And um, don't forget, I mean, they, they need purpose for their roles as well. And that's their motivation is to, is to make a difference. So um, presenting to them projects, ideas, which are not self-serving empire building projects. You can forget that right now, that's not big science. Big science is things that have broad scope of impact that's way beyond um, uh, the minutiae of discovery. Um, also, um, things that have that are in line with maybe strategic directions which are already in place or um, um, goals or things that are on the government agenda already will always do really well. Um, but yeah, to raise an issue, but you have to think big you have to present it in context of, um, of, of what is important to government, what jobs, um, sustainability. It doesn't hurt to read, you know, the policy um, books and, and white papers that get circulated around. It gives you context. And I think you always have to present your big idea in context. Um, yeah, but I, I would say government is very receptive. And you just need to find the conduit in order to access it, access them. Yeah, yeah, that's great to hear. Right? Because you you don't have that insight really if you're early on in your career. You no. there's a, there's a large distance between you as a researcher and what happens on the state level, and you don't know understand you don't understand why nothing goes into combating climate change or the question that concern you and where you put hours of work in. So that's that's really good to hear. Um, I think Ian, you also have been, um, you're an envoy for the Queensland government as well. So you, you probably have a lot of interaction as well with, um, with the Queensland government in terms of what to do with, uh, in agriculture, right? Yeah, certainly. But I, I think, um, and I, I agree with all the comments that have been made, um, probably just make the point that for the first 15 or 20 years of my research career, I didn't receive any ARC funding. So all of my money came from other, uh, other research sources. Um, I think for anybody uh, looking to develop a research agenda, you've got to ask yourself, who's, whose problem are you solving? Um, and I think that's one of the really, the really fundamental questions. Um, a, lot of, a lot of researchers start with, uh, they, they want to work on a big idea. And big ideas are great. You've got to get to the big idea. But first, you've got to work out who's, who's actually going to be interested in that idea. 
and uh, it could be industry uh, if it's a very direct industry or economic issue that you, you're dealing with. Um, but even if it is an industry specific issue, it could have broader consequences. It could lead to jobs uh, that benefit the economy. It could lead to climate change benefits that benefit the, uh, the, the climate change agenda. It could lead to waste reduction. All of these things are really important to government as well as to industry. And if you can get alignment between uh, solving an industry problem and solving a government problem, then you start to really be on a, on, onto, a, onto a good area. So I, so I encourage um, certainly my early career researchers, my postdocs and others to think about um, whose problem do you want to address? Where do you want to, what do you want to do with your career? What, uh, what change, what impact do you want to make on the world? Identify that and then get active in the community that is interested in that. So for instance, if you want to work on, if, you, if your interest is really in waste reduction, you want to work on plastic waste, then, you know, yes, you could go to an academic conference in Belfast or in Prague um, and have a wonderful three or four days work, you know, network, or well, used to be able to do that, working <laughs> with, um, you know, working with, you know, talking with academics around the world on, on, on the hottest sites. But if you actually want to start to generate um, to research funding and, and research ideas and research impact, then what you want to be doing is talking with the people in uh, Australia or your local communities you want to be getting in touch with the waste management associations or the or, or, or the waste um, management companies. You want to be talking with the waste uh, the departments of environment in your um, in, in your local governments, um, because they're the people who can actually help you to facilitate uh, your idea of becoming a research project and ultimately becoming impact. Um, so I tell my people get out into the communities, identify which community you want to be part of, get out in the community, network, become known. Nobody's going to fund you if you're not known. Um, and as you and, and validate your ideas, you might think you've got a wonderful idea, but but as you talk with people in that community, you'll 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 either you know validate that idea, you'll work out that it's actually really good, or people will say that's that will never work for these reasons. Um, so I think it's really important for early career researchers to um, to get into the community, but also recognise the multiple benefits that your research will generate, uh, and so and and then sort of start to talk to industry. Um, it's not easy to get to government, um, but as Natalie said, it's very powerful um, and very uh, welcome when you do. Uh, the governments, government are looking for people with good ideas. They're looking for people that will drive, help them to drive their agenda along. Uh, and all governments have um, climate change policies. They've got uh, waste reduction policies. They've got agricultural policies. They've got regional employment policies. These things are all really critically important to government. So think about the broader implications of your research. And stay focused on the impact that you want to, that you want as a researcher want to have on the world. Yeah, that's great to hear. So very much focused on the community and um, finding the right um, problems to solve as well, and getting in touch with the right people. Um, Deborah, you wanted to say something as well to that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, as an actual government scientist, and yep. you know, th this is very much the nexus in which we work. This point where the community and industry and government come together. Um, I did miss a bit of what Paul was saying. Apologies. I had a bit of a connection issue, so apologies if I repeat anything you've said already. Um, but I think really it is for this group to think about careers beyond academia. That was a very secure pathway for, for a long time. I agree with what Ian Paulson said in the chat, but I don't think it's as bleak as perhaps um, where this conversation started. But there are very many opportunities for scientists beyond academia as well. And there are so many things that are more important than publications in so many strands of science. The government science is very much about public good and ensuring that an effective evidence base underpins policy. And so that touches on everything from climate change to waste management to what are the chemicals that our primary industries are using to, um, you know, across medicine and so forth as well. So we basically um, use as an in-kind investment the salaries of our scientists and then we look for support um, 
technical and support staff to support the operating to support the travel and in return we ensure then that we are delivering outputs which will actually affect practice change um, a lot of the time that concentration has been on productivity how do you grow more for less but increasingly now we are turning our minds to more complex and wicked problems so the kinds of things like drought and um, you know, water use efficiency and how to cope with depleted soils, really quite complex issues. Again, we find that we can almost never answer those questions by ourselves. So we have a very well connected, um, uh, a very well connected network. So certainly for people on this group, one way to start to get in with government is to look for ways uh, people who are doing, people who, within government who have skills that you need, um, and obviously you can do that just through the publications space, but who are people who would complement your own skills, bring value to your script, to your, um, to your skills base, value to your programs, allow you to then actually craft projects together. Um, uh, government science, well, science generally is always that continuum around risk management and going from the blue sky through to the really applied. A lot of government research has in the past been in uh, very, uh, very much fixed at the applied end. We're now thinking more strategically and allocating funds more specifically to, um, to that more blue sky end, hence our investment in synthetic biology, for example. Um, so certainly thinking about community benefit, community betterment, job creation, they're really fundamental um, issues for us in thinking about how we make those investments and how we work with people in academia and industry. How do we affect that practice change on the ground? So the science is just as interesting and just as challenging, um, but I guess it tends to be more applied. For me, that's part of why I went into agriculture from medical research, because I could more immediately see the impact of the work that I was doing. Yep. Yeah, great, great to hear your perspective from, from actually somebody working, working for the government directly. Um, I've seen your hand, Mark. Um, we wanted to have the questions answered from the audience, but yeah, you can briefly comment on that if you want. Just to point out and to address how do you, how does an ECR get in to talk to government? Yep. The key part here is that when we think of government, it's not just the elected white old white man uh, sitting in in parliament. There needs to be an engagement across the entire uh, ecosystem of yes elected officials, but also fantastic government staffers who work in the government departments, who, as we're hearing here, are actually the ones, boots on the ground, actually implementing the science. And often we think that going to Canberra or going to Parliament House of whichever state you're in is the nice shiny thing to do. That's not the way to actually engage truly across the whole ecosystem of government. And you need to build relationships with the minister, the minister's assistant, the minister's uh, key staffer, the, the head of the department, the, the officer who's responsible for the research project right the way through. And you need to establish those relationships before you even know you want anything. Because if you go in the door and straight away say, I need a million dollars, please, because my idea is the best idea, they'll just say, see you later, because they've just finished a meeting with someone else who's asked them for $10 million who might actually address something they want. So really, really building those relationships throughout the whole ecosystem is absolutely critical uh, to be able to, for, for anybody from ECRs through senior professors to continually invite those um, engagements and providing greater value to those people. Yeah, great. So it's really much a holistic interaction on each level, not just, yeah, not just see it as them and us, yeah. And we had one question from the audience so by Phil. I mean, we have also Ian Paulson to asking, but you basically answered that just now, um, how an ECR get, gets the foot in the door to talk, to talk to the government. But Phil Gu was asking, has the university system caught up with this way of thinking yet? So I, can't, I don't remember which way of thinking we're talking about at this moment, but maybe we can have Phil talking. I'm just gonna allow him to talk 
So one of the challenges coming up is that a lot of our research, I know my research position was yeah. funded indirectly because the university had international students and international students cost a lot of money uh, for the individual student and therefore there was profit from the university to socialize to research. That's gone. We've already seen 17,000 research positions and teaching positions within universities lost in the last 18 months because of COVID. Yeah. 17,000 people across HAS and STEM and other spaces, professions, are no longer employed within the university sector in Australia. The opportunity to have universities direct at will large amounts of research dollars to research positions is not going to be, on the short term, an opportunity that the government nor the university is going to want to do. And so, yes, the universities are walking to a beat of a very different drum, and that drum is not one that is what it used to be um, for when I went through PhD only 20 years ago. So this is a fundamentally changed sector. Now, I might sound bad, and it all might sound gloomy, but actually this is really exciting because you are now in the position to innovate, to actually drive forward to create the solution because there's still educational requirements. There's still problems that need solved. We just need to do it in a different way. Um, and we can't expect to apply for a grant once a year to then get a no or a maybe at the end of that year. There are so many different ways to get this science happening and iterating forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great to hear. And um, we actually, I actually found more question, questions on the Q&A section. And um, Alex Carpenter's question was actually voted the highest. It, five people agreeing on his question. And um, yeah, we, he was asking, given the low success rate and the slow pro progress of scientific projects and the tight margins and high pressures faced by businesses, how long can we expect industry pro to provide funding for the scientific community? Will we develop a bad reputation for high cost and low outputs um, in an industrial context? I guess what, yeah, in, in simple terms put, like how much can we expect the industry to, to, to fund the, the scientific research at, at universities, right? And um, on that note as well, similar question is by Tom Williams. He is asking like, how, how can we negotiate the terms of IP and commercialization from um, um, university research teams if they, wanna, if they wanna fund a startup? I'm, I'm happy to have a, have a bit of a crack. Um, yeah. first, but I'm sure others will have some, some comments there as well. Um, look, in Australia, we have actually very low, uh, you know, compared to OECD, very low levels of industry contribution to research um, in universities. So actually, there's, um, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not when you, get, when you go to industry that, um, that there's a certain pot of money that's being split amongst researchers. I mean, that's, with, that's the way it is with the ARC. It's only so much money, and we, the more people that apply, the, the lower the success rate. I actually think the more uh, university people, the more the more researchers that go and talk and genuinely engage with industry around their problems, the more money we'll actually unlock from industry, and the more benefit we'll provide to industry. Um, so, um, so I, th I think we've actually got scope to double, triple, or you know, or you know, beyond quadruple the amount of money that uh, comes from industry to research. But obviously, that research has to provide value. Um, and obviously, we want to be making sure that we're doing it for the right reasons, that, um, that we're thinking about the, the benefits of the research that we're doing, we're thinking about the impact, that we're considering uh, the relationships that we're building, and we're looking at long-term um, valued, trusted partnerships, not short-term money grabs um, to do research that, you know, gets us, you know, that, that gives a short-term benefit. So I, I think, actually, um, that, you know, we're nowhere near the levels that we should be getting from industry, um, but also recognise that not all, all industry research funding goes to universities. So we need to think much more about the ecosystem that we're building as well. Um, you know, it's, it should, uh, people coming out of, a, out of a PhD should be thinking as much about, uh, you know, startup funding as they are about a, a future postdoc position. Um, we should be thinking about how we collectively as a sector build the ecosystem that actually has research embedded right across uh, government, right across industry, right across the startup sector. And we've got this really collaborative, supportive ecosystem because that's actually, uh, it's everything working together that will help us to drive uh, technology forward and help us to drive impact. Yeah. 
Hey, great answer, great answer. I think uh, Tom and Alex got their answers, definitely. Um, so we want to switch terms a bit, otherwise we don't get to talk about the other subjects and we're already a bit, bit behind time. So the second, um, our second section basically was uh, focused more about collaboration because we thought that is the second or maybe the most important aspect of big science because nowadays you can't solve big challenges alone anymore. It's not going to be the, the, the lonely scientists in the lab anymore that solve these big questions and we already heard about that. So with big, large collaborative research hubs, like for example, an ARC Center of Excellence that lasts for seven years and um, maybe a CRCP um, that lasts for even 10 years, like how do you track um, success? How do you measure success along the lines? How does that work? Do you have milestones or how can you make sure this collaboration was actually a success? Or at what point do you say, oh, we're gonna steer in a different direction, we have to fix something? So I think everybody that has been um, on, a, on a large collaborative research project, maybe uh, Deborah, if you, you can answer that from like a researcher point of view, from a research leader point of view, how, how did that feel in like long-term governmental funded research projects? Thanks, Dom. Yeah, hopefully I won't freeze up this time. Um, I guess for us, the best, um, measure of success of a collaboration is that it becomes one of several. Uh, you start out small, builds bigger, brings in new partners. Um, it'll classically fit within a balanced portfolio. So somewhere on that spectrum for, for us from the highly applied to the more blue sky. Uh, we want to see that it fits a strategic, our own strategic policies, the policies or the strategy of the government. You know, we have things like premier's priorities and minister's priorities. We need to be uh, cognizant of those, but we're still independent of the politics. So we need to also be able to advocate for the kind of um, science, uh, the approaches, the partnerships that we know are actually going to be of most benefit. We really wanna be seeing practice change on the ground from the work that's being undertaken um, and again it does take a very long time to actually be able to see those things coming into effect we always build in some quick wins but there are obviously always some things which will take potentially years to come together um, in the current environment and especially post-covid we're thinking a lot about how we create jobs and we underpin regional communities in our case obviously we're supporting farmers who then uh, or our research is supporting farmers which then provides investment into uh, regional communities and helps keep schools open and those kinds of things so we are learning to draw a longer bow about how we actually measure the success of our project. It's very easy to get caught up in the idea that publications are the measure of success or you have a field day and 100 people turn up and that makes it successful. But if you don't actually see a reduction in you know, use of noxious chemicals associated with in, uh, introduction of an integrated pest management strategy, for example, then just having people turn up isn't actually any kind of um, any kind of real measure. So job creation is really important to us. We're also learning how to recognise and advocate better for the value of an educated, agile workforce. So our scientists are working in particular disciplines. We cover a lot of disciplines, but they're also able to um, adapt information from, you know, if they're veterinary scientists, they might be adapting information from human science, they might be um, uh, working with um, people in uh, the Department of Health on specific issues. So, you know, it's very much about, um, I suppose, thinking about how we actually have this resource which can't be turned on and off. We all realise the, um, the years of training that going into being able to um, effectively design and uh, answer scientific questions to actually then be able to move knowledge forward, move our community forward. Um, but it's, it's learning how to also look for ways to be able to quantitate some of those things that are actually capturing social benefit. Um, so we are 
many of our projects will include um, postgraduate students or um, otherwise provide professional development pathways we're looking for ways to also be able to capture those so it's not only um, how have we helped industry make you know produce more carrots and uh, use fewer chemicals to do that it's also about how have we trained people to understand the deepest physiology of carrots and how might we use synthetic biology to um, ensure that they have a higher nutritive value and therefore we're um, providing functional foods for the community and those kinds of things. We're very much in an early stage for some of those um, less tangible and perhaps more innovative and more modern ways of thinking about value. Um, but for, a, for us, those are real um, new measures that we're looking to build into all of our research programs and something which has always been at our core, but again, we haven't articulated well, is about how we actually not only advance knowledge generally, but also advance the careers of our scientists as well. Um, so we've got a number of different um, pathways and different um, streams that people are involved in and we're always looking to be able to or we're designing better ways to be able to capture the way that they actually then um, progress their own careers um, build their own auto autonomy set up their own networks those kinds of things yeah thanks so it's 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 probably easier if it's a, if there's a tangible outcome tangible metric like jobs but harder if you take into consideration something like education of the people and training of future work staff and then it's probably harder to measure yeah. do the others see that the same way or uh, like other do you, uh, do you guys have experience that you actually find very tangible metrics for measuring success alongside a long long collaboration is there something like the same in in, in industry where you have kpi to meet or uh, how, how does that work Maybe, maybe somebody else wants to comment on this as well. Um, maybe it's where bioplatforms is positioned in the ecosystem, but our um, measures of impact are a little less um, sort of in point and applied as what Deborah described there. Um, so we re recognize that there is, you know, such a long technology development pathway and so we we support a lot of projects um, from concept all the way all the way through and we're trying to um, we see a big gap in that proof of concept or that sampling kind of space where you have a great idea you need proof of concept experiments which are not applicable to ARC funding or any of your traditional means and so we're trying to bridge that gap a little bit so then you can go to someone like Paul um, and say look I've got this great idea and I think it'll work because I've done this this and this um, so show some evidence de-risk projects a little bit um, before you can go on to seek some funding um, but sorry, the question was about impact again, but um, I'm off topic. But yeah, I, I, um, I think that we measure impact um, more in the development of the ecosystem. I think any networks created, um, any successes or people within that network who go on to successes, we take that as our success. Um, we're there to lift all boats. And so um, if we can build resources, if we can build and lift someone else's success, then, then we consider, consider that an impactful result. Um, there was one time um, I was about to do a pitch on Bioplatform's behalf, so I'm in an international meeting and sitting there just browsing the internet and I found our koala genome, for instance, which has been a great hit had been used at um, Boston University to investigate the transmission of chlamydia from mother to, to babies. And they were using the koala genome from bioplatforms as I'm sitting there um, as their model. So that's an impact which is far reaching across the world that you could never foresee. And so we take that as great. Um, and so it's not an economical result, but we know that we're keeping research and that investigative capability alive. And so, yeah. It's not yep. a waste about the money. 
Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That's great. That's great to hear. Uh, Mark, you wanted to comment on that? Or? Yeah, just the, the classic phrase that I hear from the ARC and from federal ministers is we need to be better curators of our own history. So a really interesting example is the University of Colorado, where I post off. They didn't know themselves that they were the only institution in the world that had put an object on every single planet within our solar system. Even NASA hasn't achieved that, and the University of Colorado had, but they didn't tell anybody that they'd done that and because they didn't know themselves. So it, it actually is worthwhile telling the stories and creating the resources to tell those stories um, to actually get that message out there of the successes of past, uh, past successes. Um, that... That often isn't usually the way we go about it if we're just doing a publication. We'll tell the paper, tell the story about the paper, and then we'll move on. And we don't think about how do we get that out to a broader audience of you know, updates. Because I've been in Canberra, and they have been reading out in Parliament the awardees of the cupcake, the best cupcakes from their local area because that's what they had been given, and they had the time to speak in Parliament, so they read that out. Imagine if there was a summary of the cool paper that came from Macquarie University on synthetic biology solutions that are, you know, doing great things. Give the politicians, give the department, give the, the, the industry the stories to tell because they'll tell the good story. Right. We have to, we have to beat the cupcakes at least. That's, I think that's, uh, that should be, <laughs> should be the least. Eh? There you go. There you go. That's <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's, yeah, definitely scientific outreach. We wanted to include it as well. Um, but coming back to the collaboration side of things, we had one more question, which was quite interesting from all of the SBA Sydney team. And probably also because it's a concerning for a lot of people actually doing research on the bench and everybody involved in grant writing and research hubs. And the question was basically, how do you balance everybody's interests in a large collaboration like what can you distribute how can you distribute for example between linkage grants it's sometimes really hard and i mean myself in that position as well like what do you give the industry partner what do you give the collaborators at the university how do you manage that maybe yeah maybe yeah ian you have i mean you have like had a lot of projects probably with industry partners over over the time maybe you want to comment on that yeah, I so say, do you mean from a budgetary perspective, how much do you give them, or or do you mean sort of more from the perspective of where you devote the effort? Um, no, yeah, more in terms of, we were thinking more in terms of reward, right? Because everybody has to be incentivized in actually putting their effort in, and it, it creates also the force to also work together. Of course, there's a communal project, and everybody wants to solve, solve a certain challenge, but we were thinking like from the undergraduate researcher to the industry CSO CTO like what okay. what is there to incentivize is it only publications and IP or yeah no look um look I think um you know my experience with industry is and and broad collaborations industry government academia is that everybody understands that um that, that, that people need different things in a collaboration I, I you know I think that's pretty much taken for granted um so you know industry understands that publications are important um, government understands that as well um, I, I think um, what's important at the start of any collaboration is you understand what you're trying to achieve and that there's some common purpose to what you were, what you're all trying to achieve um, you know so I, again I think why do we become scientists um, why you know I'm an engineer why do we become scientists and, and research engineers um, you know, is, is our goal ultimately to have the most number of publications of anyone in our field, you know, so that when, you know, so that when we retire at 75, 85, 90, um, you know, that, that we've got more publications than anybody else and a higher impact factor. Um, that's great. Um, you know, obviously that's a one, one element of success. Um, but ultimately we've got to say, well, what's the, you know, from my perspective, from, from a lot of the people I work with, what's the impact we've had on the world? What, what change have we made? Um, is you know have we have going back to um, to what Deborah said before have we reduced the amount of toxic chemicals in the environment have we made a more sustainable planet for our children um, you know have we impacted in a, in a positive way the direction of climate change um, 
you know, so I think when you go into a into a collaboration with industry government, everyone's got to have a, some sort of agreement as to what we're trying to achieve. And they're the objectives of the research project. And we all work hand in hand to achieve those objectives. Um, but in doing so, there are some side benefits. And the side benefits might be you get to publish um, you know, some really great publications. The side benefit might be that um, the industry might get to make a bit more money from, from what they're doing. The side benefit may be the government gets re-elected um, because they've seen some really positive outcomes. So I think we have to think about all of those things as side benefits of, um, of impactful research. Um, but ultimately, it's, the, it's getting the impact from the research that is, you know, look, this is my perspective, I guess. Um, and you know, my perspective is that um, you know, we have this time on our planet to achieve something. Um, and that achievement might be some really fundamental science that, that impacts the world in a really positive way in 50 years time. Um, but as long as we're heading towards that objective and we all agree on what the objective is, uh, everybody understands that there needs to be some side benefits for all the parties out of the, out of the work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It sounds like we're all working on the same goals, but we just have to somehow find a way to work together and make everybody get a basically a piece of the reward as well. And it doesn't mean you don't need to renegotiate at times as well. So, you know, in a project, um, you know, things, things change, um, you know, um, from an industry perspective, their quarterly profit results might be really, you know, just, just become top of mind for a period. They might, um, they might push you a bit harder to do something from your, uh, your own perspective. You might need to get a paper out because that will help with the promotion or it will help with, um, with the future grant application. You know, we do need to reprioritize. We need to renegotiate, but provided we've got these respectful, trustful partnerships with the people we work with and provided that overall we're heading in the same direction, and we're being responsive and supportive of the other the other collaborators, um, then then things tend tend to sort of work out pretty well. Yep. Cool. Um, I want to ask at least one question from the audience. I, I see you you guys are also answering them per, per typing in, which is great. So I think everybody gets their questions answered. Um, Jocelyn Jones um, asked, "How do you walk the fine line of broadcasting your breakthroughs to get traction?" collaboration and publications while protecting your IP so you can uh, ensure future investment. Does anybody have ever been in that situation or has like given advice on this? Surely Paul's got something to say. Paul, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll take the glass half full moment because apparently I'm doing that tonight. An idea <laughs> is worth nothing. An idea is worth absolutely nothing. Until you have demonstrated evidence that that idea is practical and scalable, that is when you have value. So we in universities have ideas and our IP managers love to patent things that are untransactable intellectual property. That is, it can't then go together in a suite of intellectual property that will add value to a portfolio that then could be sold and transacted in a startup or you know, by a startup. Unfortunately, that means industry does really well, especially in drug development and, and other spaces. They do fantastically well at keeping their secrets very close to their chest until they have a solution and they've got the entire sector, the entire area covered with um, patents to then make, move things forward. I would argue in, in the academic sector, we need to be partnering early so that our idea isn't my idea, It's our collective big science idea with our industry partner hand in hand, who is the logical person that's going to then take that forward and translate it. Um, but Paul, tell me, tell me I'm wrong or tell me I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere on a, on a spectrum there. Um, I'm, I got to agree with, with you overwhelmingly then, Mark. The first piece of that, I'm going to go a little bit further with regard to your statement about the value of an idea. I'm going to say a patent is worth nothing until such time as it's commercialized. What's, what's the value of a piece of paper? Now, clearly, the moment at which you can commercialize that patent, it can have significant value. Uh, but somebody's asked the question, uh, other than Joss, there was an earlier question about uh, negotiating with TTOs around this tech. And I'm, uh, I'm in the midst of a, a particularly intriguing one right at the moment. And the proposition we put to them amongst others Fed to me, incidentally, as I prepped for the conversation by talking to um, five or six different VCs to build the argument, 
um, was until such time as that patent is commercialized, it's actually worth nothing. Secondly, uh, and a related question for one of the previous questions around how do you negotiate with a uni that the scientists should be part of the action as opposed to simply, I take it the, the converse is we the uni will just license it to, I don't know, some Chinese multinational or something. Um, the people that have developed the tech, you the scientists that have developed the tech, are clearly the smarts, you're the talent. VCs prioritize that. They prioritize the smarts beyond the tech itself. Why? Because commonly the tech, to use the cliche jargon, pivots. It commonly changes through the commercialization process. So you, you, you develop a piece of research and you think this has got great applicability here. But then you actually go in and talk to industry about it and you build your MVP or prototypes or whatever it may be. And you realize, well, it's not here. It's actually more there. Now, the, generally speaking, the only people that can apply effectively that pivot to the technology, or not the only people, the, but the people that need to be front and center of that process are you, the scientists that developed that. So that would be the argument that I would, uh, that would be an argument that I would use in the discussion with the TTO. But, related, but it relates strongly to that previous comment of Marx around, you need to be front and center around commercialization of that of that tech, because until you are, until it gets commercialized, the tech doesn't actually have, the patent doesn't have any value. Uh, does that, I don't know whether yeah, that's Yeah, no, that, that's very insightful. Yeah, I think, yeah, <laughs> Jocelyn probably, I, 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 as you can see her point, I think she was probably managing, how do you manage that balance of sharing rather than like grabbing onto yourself, right? Because people are also afraid of like, maybe that's not a, not a justified fear actually of, losing the idea because it's not worth anything before it hasn't been realized. That's what I learned. Like, yeah, if you, if you haven't really actually got it from the ground up, then it's not really worth anything. So that probably uh, tends more towards sharing your idea and uh, having more collaborations before you can actually patent something and before you can commercialize anything. That's how I understood I've, it. I've always learned more from my industry collaborators than I ever give them knowledge. And I don't tell them that. Um, and I still <laughs> charge them lots of money but they provide so much relevance and so their own cutting edge knowledge that uh, I'm, I'm literally a sponge in those meetings. And they might be furiously writing down stuff that I think is you know, pretty boring, but it, it truly therefore is a collaboration um, that it, the value comes from the interaction of the hands-on coalface worker and the academic boffin. Um, and, and yes, there are going to be some sharks. There are always sharks out there who are just uh, in scrupulous pain in the butt who just steal ideas. But you work out who those people are and you don't meet with them. Uh, and they have a bad reputation in the field. And you, you go and talk to someone like Paul and say, hey, do you know this person? Should I talk to them? And Paul will say, yeah, yeah, fantastic, or hell no. Um, and there are plenty of people around who have had that experience and who are there to mentor and guide you. And that's often what you get out of being in an incubator or being in a mentoring program. It's the connections to quality people who just want to see you succeed. And they do exist. Yeah, I can see Natalie, you are, you're agreeing with that. Yeah. You're shaking sure. your head. <laughs> yeah. And that's the solution as well, Mark, spot on. Um, I'm going to be a little bit counter here, contrary to Paul about the comment about, um, you know, a patent being worth nothing. Um, I mean, the, that doesn't help so much the, the researcher when they're in an argument with the university over an equity share of, of where this patent's going to go. And, um, and clearly somebody sees value in it if there's an argument occurring. So um, if it's not worth anything, do you know, from the researcher's perspective, are no, you I'm arguing, giving I'm, it I'm up? Arguing in, I'm arguing in heated agreement with the researcher who developed the patent. So my argument is that a, a uni will typically 
put a premium on the value of the patent itself and basically argue that they're the people that funded that patent mm -hmm. because they paid your salary through the process of doing the research and they they employed their lawyers to put in the patent. That's the, you know, that's the starting point typically of the typical TTO. Um, the VC perspective is, well, that's fine, but until such time as that's commercialized, that patent actually has no value. And the people that, that need to be there to help with that commercialization of the scientists that were implicit in that patent or that drove that patent. Yeah. And, and therefore you should put a premium on the value of the team, the value that the VC see is predominantly with the team that bring the patent with them, if that makes sense. The patent on it, the, the argument I guess I'm sharing um, is, is where the, where, the, where the uni is saying, yeah, but as an alternative to letting you take your patent and spin it out into your own business, my alternative is to cut a license deal with ABC Limited in China or in Germany or wherever it may be. And I can earn more money doing that. Yeah. So my, my approach is to arm the scientists that develop that patent with the comment of, well, I don't agree because we're the ones, we're the smarts behind that patent. We're the people that are needed to defend that patent if it hasn't gone through the defense processes yet. Plus, we're the guys that need to iterate around that and add the additional tech that will, you know, complement that going forward. That's the value, if that makes sense. So I'm not saying the patent itself is, is worthless. I, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that the value is in you guys as the scientists that develop it, as opposed to the piece of paper. Thanks, Paul. Right. <laughs> no, no, I think that's what people wanted to hear. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think we have to get going and um, come to our last section, which is your vision or this term, your vision of big science. And uh, yeah, we have also some questions for that section as well. There was one hard question, which I think is hard to frame a bit, but it kind of always appears in a lot of meeting that researchers or research collaborations in Australia, they're looking for a certain niche. I mean, a lot of big Australian science is research is focused towards Australian problems, Australian challenges. And we heard it all also in the introduction that it's very important also like to solve problems for Australians because nobody else solves, that, solves them. I think that's what a lot of people said. And we were thinking, is that actually limiting your approach, should Australian researchers also play on the same scale as everybody else in the world and aim for like really, really big science project, like the next human genome project or something completely out of the blue that at first sight might not have a particular impact for Australian, but it might have for the whole, whole world, right? And then anyway, for Australians later on as well. I hope yeah. that makes sense, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely they should. Um, yeah, to connect with what's going on globally is very important um, and to create those relationships and to bring that skill. It's a two way street, right? Skills and expertise um, and flow of ideas in both directions. Um, I think no one here is representing East 2.0. Deb mentioned it. So um, I'll bring that up again. That was a, a great win for Macquarie to think early to leverage in joining that project. Um, it's an international project which has, um, I don't know, I'm going to get it wrong, 11, I don't know, um, international partners on it from different institutions, very high calibre institutions across the world. And to connect into that community immediately into in such a, a large ongoing project um, was great leverage for the university. And um, Deborah Halstones and the DPI were came in on funding quite early with that, as did Bio Platforms. It attracted lots of money because there was global relevance to that project. So yeah, big international schemes. And if you can contextualize it with Australia, all the better. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. A lot of people were involved in that. And I think yeah, probably the impacts of that like they, they're going to be apparent in the future as well, like further down the track rather than just well, after. Not, 
Yeah, not not simply though. I mean, if you think of how, um, if you think of the ecosystem which has been created now, so you know, researchers at Macquarie can call Imperial College and just say, "Hey, I've just got this. What do we reckon I should do with it?" Or I've got this problem. I mean, that's invaluable. Rather mm. than doing the dear professor so and so, I've worked at so and so at Sydney Uni and whatever, and I would like to know. I mean, you know, that's nice, but it's not a great connection. Mm. And um, to cross those barriers instantly like that is it's a big deal and I, you can't measure the impact of that that's what I'm talking about it's it's the ecosystem that's the important right and right. just to, to pick that up I mean I would see the yeast 2.0 project as something that then has evolved into a bigger but um, largely Australianized um, project so funded through Australian mechanisms and then reaching out internationally so putting Australia at the centre but then reaching out rather than it being Australia added on to the yeast 2.0 project so that's that's even that's bigger in, in a range of different ways because it's focused or it's led from Australia it's able to concentrate more on those Australian issues and do it in a way that actually provides appropriate levels of investment investment to actually get the work done. It's also, um, in my view, quite unique in terms of some of the aspects that it's looking at, even in thinking about primary industries, for example, you don't see it so much of that in similar enterprises overseas. So we do see that as something that's really, really groundbreaking and the ability to yeah, build on that initial large um, node that was led by a bigger project from overseas, but then um, mature that into something which is which has a higher level of ownership and a higher level of engagement across Australia has been spectacular to see. So you know we would really support what um, Nat was saying there about you know uh, keep your eye on the local problems, but certainly ensure that you've got those international connections. There's a lot of analytics around now about, you know, what are the most cited and most impactful publications. And they do tend to be things with large teams from a range of nations, from a um, range of disciplines. So it's, you know, big, big science making its way into big and impactful publications as well. So I think that's really what we want to see developing in the Australian ecosystem. I mean, when I did my PhD, really it was like if you didn't do an overseas postdoc, you weren't really licensed to think sort of thing. But I think we've got beyond that now. People go overseas because of other reasons if they choose to do that for their postdocs, but it isn't like it has to be that way. So it's really bolstering Australian science, the Australian innovation system, um, and being able to, you know, really secure some great programs and some great outcomes for the Australian community. Great. Yeah, I, th I saw that E.A. Paulson just commented with, without use 2.0, there would never have been a center of excellence in Symbio. She is uh, right, I guess. So that's that for in direct impact of the use 2.0 project. Um, yeah, so we have covered most of the curated questions, actually. Um, if there is there anything that you would like, maybe in 30, 30 seconds, one minute, that you would like to say to the audience, like, what is the one most big important thing that has to be there in the future, has to change in the future, or that would enable big science in, in Australia? If you want to go first, Mark, yeah. Yeah, sure. From my seat, I think bench to, to bookshelf science will be the demise of big science. So what I mean by that is if we simply take an idea and publish it, that is not sufficient anymore. We need to be taking our science beyond the bookshelf. And I argue it needs to go to the boardroom. And that boardroom can be a community um, group. It can be an industry group. It, it can be government um, cabinet. But it has to go beyond the bookshelf because inherent within scientific publications is a exclusive language and exclusive access to knowledge. And in order for this to translate from fantastic fundamental science to the big picture, big solution science, we have to take that further. Now that means today, and I was talking at a school just the other week, and a kid who was in year three asked me the question, but why can't I just be a scientist anymore? Isn't that just enough? And unfortunately, for the majority of the people who are out there today, 
it's not just going to be enough. We need to do more because everybody else is being asked to do more in a similar way. And so we need to be those innovators, the communicators, the entrepreneurial um, scientists out there, which means it's going to be a fantastically fun and diverse job. And there's no way machine learning is going to replace our position. Um, but gosh, there are plenty of other jobs out there that might. So I, whilst I might sound negative, I'm trying to be disruptive to get you outside of your comfort zone to realize this is a really cool space to be in if you intentionally attack it. Because um, passive, being passive in this space is going to be really troubling and challenging uh, to expect that submitting grants will get money. It's not going to be worked that way into the future. Yeah, great. No, I appreciate it. It has to be has to be disruptive. Otherwise, nobody listen. <laughs> uh, Paul, do you want to also have a, make a statement about like what what do you think is the most important uh, point to focus on in the future? I'm going to sound like a broken record because I'm going to pick up where Mark left off once again. But um, as Kirsten can vouch for, uh, having been through the on program, which is just a superb acceleration model for commercializing deep tech, or deep science, I should say. Big science, forgive me, I'm getting the terminology wrong this evening. Um, one of the first principles they teach, and it's an established lean startup methodology, is go and talk to 100 customers. Go and talk to 100 customers. And they, they look, at, look at the smile on Kirsten's face as she's remembering all those phone calls. Um, and they define customers loosely. They could be stakeholders. They could be industry partners. They could be, uh, you know, related bodies. It, it, that doesn't matter so much. But the principle behind it is very strongly aligned to what Mark's talking about. Go out and, and identify people within, you know, the ecosystem in which your, your research could apply and um, stress test, if I can put it that that way, your, the, the focus of your research, get their input on what you're working on because they will, in my experience, more often than not add value to that process, but they will most certainly quickly give you a sense of whether or not that's got commercial viability. And irregardless, I would almost say of whether it's got commercial viability, they will probably give you good insight as to whether the research, even for science's sake, has viability. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, anybody else wants to share anything else? Or if not, we will give the word uh, to Dana, I think. She's still here. I am still here. I've been listening intently. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that's been a great discussion from all the panelists, and I think that the um, the experience that the panelists have has been crucial to give um, some really good guidance and some good suggestions to to all of the um, all of the listeners tonight and participants. Um, so yeah, but tonight, you know, along with Decode Science, are the distributors for Twist by Science. Most of you know Twist by Science. I know a lot of you who have attended tonight. Um, but I've just been looking at the interaction on the question and answer um, portal and who's asked the most questions and sort of got the most responses. So tonight I'm going to give the um, $400 twist voucher for gene synthesis to Jocelyn Johns, who posed a few questions and got some good responses as well. So I will coordinate with her directly and then hopefully she can utilise that voucher to um, continue the work that she's doing. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And it's been great to um, participate tonight and listen to all the excellent discussions. Thank great. You. Thank you, Dana. Thank you as well for sponsoring again. We really appreciate it. And um, thank you for all the panelists. It was really insightful. I honestly enjoyed it a lot. I think we got a lot of really um, good questions answered and it was actually way more commercially and application focused that I would thought it would be. I thought it would be more about like how to fill up an ARC application or grant application, but um, it wasn't. And it was really refreshing to hear all your answers. Uh, so, yep. Thank you all. And um, yeah, we hope to see you at the next meetup again. So we will we ha we'll have an accompanying event for the SBA 2021 conference. We don't know yet if that will be in person. So we, we hope we can at least enjoy a pint with our fellow 
fellow, fellow scientists in Sydney, but we, we don't know how the situation will be in September. So I guess we just have to wait. Um, also, if anybody is interested to participate in our SBA Sydney team or in any um, SBA nodes across Australia or New Zealand, please come forward. We're always looking for more people. It doesn't matter if you are like an undergraduate scientist or if you're like a CSO of a company, it doesn't matter. So we really appreciate everybody's um, um, interaction. So and if you want to rewatch that event, you can do that on YouTube. I think it will be up by mid next week. And yep, um, that's it from my side. So yep, thank you all for joining in. And Bye. I hope you have a wonderful night. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I was going to give the SBA a bit of a plug and everyone who's okay. Um, um, okay, so the conference is coming up. So it'd be really nice to have you all on board. There's going to be some great speakers and um, uh, joining us. Uh, the AGM for the association will not be run at the same time. I think you would have had enough Zoom by then. It'll be um, a couple of months later. Um, but we are uh, voting on a new executive committee. So everyone... Can not you can nominate yourselves. The forms and things will come around. The package will come around probably late September. But I want you all to start thinking about how you can get involved and make more impact and have more reach to government and other government agencies and things like that to, to help your fellow um, researcher. So please consider yourselves. We'd love to have lots of nominees for that executive committee. Thank you.